The story I, I want to tell you today is a bit of a story of kind of self-realization. Um, and it starts with a bit of historical trivia. In 1856, the notorious murderer William Palmer, a man who Charles Dickens called the greatest villain in England, uh, was hung for his crimes. And the story goes that as he ascended the gallows uh, to meet his sentence, uh, he had a wry smile on his face. And when he got to the top and stood on the platform, he pointed at the trap door that he was shortly to plummet through and looked at his executioner and said, are you sure that thing's safe? <laughs> That's dry British humor for those of you who only watch American television. Um, but yeah, this is actually a true story, and, and the legend behind it is that um, that is the story of how the term gallows humor uh, was born, uh, which brings us to my story. Uh, a few years ago, I found myself living um, in an incredible and insane city that I love dearly, um, Beijing, China. Um, and uh, during the day, I was running a, a big data consulting and development firm that uh, you know, made big data advertising systems for large companies to help them better target their, their advertisers and mine massive amounts of online data to you know, better sell people sugary drinks. Uh, and uh, to keep myself sane at night, um, I produced and performed improv, improv comedy shows um, at a 200-person at a, a theater um, inside of the, the center of Beijing. Um, and uh, for those of you, probably most of you know what improv theater is, it's an art form uh, where you, you create a piece of theater, or you create a piece of sketch, a piece of comedy um, that's without a script, that's based, uh, that's created in the moment. Uh, and uh, it's largely inspired, at least the style we did, is largely inspired by what the performers on stage and the audience out there uh, is, is thinking about and what we're going through our lives. It's a, it's a way to, to, to find truth in comedy. And so you can imagine uh, what um, far too often the content of our shows were on the very many days when Beijing didn't look like this, but it looked like that. And that's a picture from exactly the same location. Um, and you can imagine uh, what we often uh, performed about when before a show we'd be scrolling through our social media feeds uh, and see vegetables that glowed in the dark uh, or hamburgers that uh, were being served and had nicely been sourced three years beforehand and had been sitting in a crate. So I realized that a couple of years, a few years ago, that we had become very good at being oddly funny about something that's really not funny. About, you know, how just go down the street and eat the radioactive food and maybe you could turn to Superman. Or if you want to learn to swim, you could just jump out your window and swim through the thick air. But the reality is this is just not funny, and I started thinking I should really be trying to do something about this. Um, and as I thought about it, and I started thinking about what are the problems that I wanted to solve, what are the problems that myself as a consumer, what are the, the products I'd like to have to, to give me a better control over this, in these environmental situations, um, I realized a few things. And the, and the odd thing is that I think in the, the last few years, these things I realized have uh, become kind of part of the the, uh, the, the PR around the Internet of Things, but the reality was at the time it was, it was very personal. Um, the first was that surely I can use all this work we were doing um, to better target people online and, and mine these massive databases. Surely somehow I can use that knowledge and that technology uh, to solve uh, some of these problems. And the second one was that you know here I was sitting um, in literally the factory of the world where every, uh, nearly every piece of consumer electronics is made, and I could walk down the street um, and source every single component uh, for pennies. And I could develop and prototype things at a very low cost. Um, and so I, we started thinking about what, what, what did I want to exist? What, did I, what problems did I want to solve? And, and, and what products did I want to exist that, that, that didn't exist? That, you know, surely here I am carrying around this, this supercomputer in my pocket. And how could I use this uh, in a productive way and, uh, for, for health and, and for wellness and, and for the environment? And as I kind of listed out all the things I wished existed and all the problems that I was hoping those would solve, um, I realized that they, they fell into kind of three, three buckets. Um, the first was, was things that made my day better. At the end of the day, how to make my day better. And I, I, I very quickly realized that for me, and, and I think for a lot of us, you know, of course, feeling physically good at the end of the day is very, very important and being physically healthy. Um, but also, you know, we spend most of our day, a lot of our day, using our mind. 
right? And, and, and having you know, a state of mind and, and, and kind of our, our mental well-being is, is equally important as how I judge at the end of the day. And I, I realized that these environmental factors that were around me had a very in, big impact on, on how I felt and, and how, how often I got sick and, and these other health things. Um, it was both a function of body and mind, a kind of broad view. Um, the second thing was, you know, I wanted technologies, I want products that what I called made society better. I wanted to be able to walk into a restaurant and know uh, whether, uh, how, what percentage of people that ate at this restaurant had gotten food poisoning, right? Or, or if I ate here for lunch, you know, how did that impact the productivity um, or how people felt of other people had eaten there, right? These are, I believe, very powerful consumer data points that are gonna have the transformative change on our supply chain and on our environment that are so critical um, and are part of some of the very huge uh, global problems that we face, that we need to empower consumers with these data. And the, the final one is, as I, as I looked around at, at family members and at, at people I loved and friends who, who were dealing uh, with, with chronic illnesses, and, and of course COPD is a very large illness uh, given the pollution, um, is, is that the healthcare system, um, particularly the healthcare system in, uh, where I was living, was just simply not able to deal with um, the, the increasingly aging populations and the challenges uh, that are there. Um, and so we had a list of all, all these kind of things that we wish existed. And, and of course, the entrepreneur in me um, realized that if you can make uh, you know, a product or a technology or a system that sits in the, the middle, that that is potentially something that um, can have a, have a great impact, but is, is also a, a viable business. Um, so we did, I started doing um, uh, the only thing I know how to do when I, when I see something that I want, which is to start hacking and start trying to build something. Um, and uh, at, at this moment, um, a, a great moment of, of serendipity happened. Um, one of the things, of course, we were looking at was measuring breathing, um, given our, our, you know, the fact that literally every breath we took was increasing our chance of dying. Um, and uh, uh, I reconnected with an old friend, uh, Nima Moraveji, who was doing his PhD at Stanford. And he was doing his PhD at looking at how you can use breathing pat patterns to influence uh, uh, users of a computer, a, a user's state of mind and their productivity. And we realized um, very, very quickly that this was extremely exciting, that, uh, that this was an answer to the consumer to that, how do I make my day better question? And that was, that was something that would drive us to be able to collect the data and to build the products we wanted to build to solve those other questions. Um, and so uh, we realized that if we can make a device, um, if we can make a, a system uh, that would uh, have collected the kind of respiratory data we are looking for as well as activity data and in robust, a robust enough way that we could do all that big data mining technology that, we, that I knew so well, um, that we might be able to, to, to build something uh, quite special. We spent a number of years um, doing that. Um, last year here at HiSum, uh, we showed um, a functional prototype that was uh, what we had patented and, and, and kind of the results of our initial labor that, that proved that we, we could in fact actually build that. And over the last year, we have been uh, working very hard to uh, move this functional prototype uh, into something that we can bring into mass production. Uh, 36 hours ago, I walked off a, a, pay, a plane from our partners in, in Dongguan in, in southern China uh, with the first crate of production, uh, production ready or production off the production line uh, spires. It looks like this. This is um, what it is, and, and we'll be shipping this uh, in, in about a month or so. So, um, in, in summary, what is, what, is, what is Fire? What's the results of this kind of story? First of all, um, it's a con the consumer application is this great device and then an app we made that gives you insight into your entire day, both when you're moving and the activity uh, levels, as well as things like focus and calm and, and tension and all these things that, that make up, uh, really, at the end of the day, what, what makes us feel good. And I, it, I took a picture of this screenshot because uh, um, those numbers might look kind of funny for you. If you're wondering what it looks like to be on a 12-hour flight with a crying baby behind you, that's what it looks like. <laughs> um, um, uh, so, so that's our app. This is the device. Um, uh, you, know, you can go to our website and check it out. We've got, some really, we've got a lot of new things in here that hasn't been seen. Um, we've got new sensors in there that have never been in a wearable device. We've got wireless charging that's never been in a wearless device. It's some cool things. Um, and you know, to tie it back to those other parts of that, um, that uh, you know, fifth grade Venn diagram I made before, um, uh, you know, we are collecting an extraordinary amount of data um, that we hope to use to um, not just solve these personal questions, but hopefully these societal problems uh, as well. Um, so, you know, uh, um, uh, the late, great Robin Williams, uh, uh, you know, is a big advocate of the fact that sometimes laughter is the best medicine. Um, and for me, you know, laughter uh, was uh, a, 
a, a spark of, to, to, to get me moving and of, of inspiration. Um, I think these problems of, of the environment and the impact of, of pollution in the environment, of our um, food supplies, uh, of an, you know, a health system that can't deal with an aging population, and of, quite frankly, you know, how do we be healthy and well in our 24-7, always connected, attention-starved society um, are some of the big uh, global uh, problems that our generation uh, has to solve. Um, and it's been, over the last years, we've been a part of the Rock Health community. Um, it's been uh, really an honor to work with and learn from so many of you in these communities, uh, so many of you here. Um, and as we start shipping, as we enter the next phase for our, our company over the next couple of months and start bringing these out to the thousands of consumers who have pre-ordered them, um, and, and I hope we'll buy them in the future, uh, we're really excited to work with all of you um, going forward. Uh, so thank you very much.